But I'm excited. I, I was praying last night, and I often ask the Lord, is there anything in the beginning of the service you want me to say before I get started and uh, before you, you lead us into the next part? And he just told me there would be someone here that you don't like Christians and you've never been a Jesus lover. Um, but there's going to be an undeniable evidence that comes today that God would do something physically in your body that you would have to acknowledge was God. And I believe even some of you, it's going to be with uh, someone that's a tailbone and someone that's cataracts, glaucoma in your eyes, that God would touch your physical eyes to let you know he's a God that can give you spiritual eyes. And he told me that someone here today has walked in with almost like a balloon full of shame. And you're heavy and you feel like you'll never be able to forgive yourself. And you thought that God could actually never forgive you. And I just felt like the Lord wanted me to tell you before I got started today that you're not that good at screwing your life up. That um, God's actually better at fixing your life than you are at screwing it up. And if you would give God this year, he could redeem in one year what you destroyed in a decade or two. If you believe it, shout a good amen. feel like preaching already. And I felt like prophetically God said, I'm taking grave clothes off of people today. Some of you have been mourning like Lazarus. It's been like a funeral. And I heard prophetically the Lord saying that this is not going to be a year of funerals. It's going to be a year of weddings. And that we're not going to bury things this year. God's going to birth things this year. If you believe that, shout a good amen in the back. And I uh, just felt so strong and my spirit stirred up that this is going to be an unusual year. And I'm going to read a passage this morning out of Acts chapter 10. And one of the guidelines God gave the apostle Peter in this story is he says, I want you to go with these people I'm sending to you, and I want you to doubt nothing. And I almost felt in my, my spirit that some of you, if you could hear what God has in store for this year, it's almost outrageous. It's off the grid, it's beyond the map, it's beyond what you've seen or tasted, and if you try to rationalize it, you'll actually talk yourself out of it. And I hear the Lord saying, I want you to believe me and doubt nothing. Say with me, doubt nothing. Come on, get in your soul today, doubt nothing. We're going to doubt our doubts this year. Amen? And we're going to believe that God can do great things. I, I'm telling you, with Baptize California, Baptize America is coming in 2025. It's a cool little praise report, but Rochelle and I just last week, out of nowhere, got invited to go to one of the most well-known pastors in America. This pastor oversees over 18,000 churches and all over the world, and his best friend is John Maxwell, and they invited us to come next, next month to John Maxwell's house, and they heard about Baptize California, and they don't know that we're going to roll out Baptize America to them. But come on, we're coming for them. 18,000 churches we could just plug into. And so I'm telling you, eye hasn't seen. Come on, somebody. Ear hasn't heard, nor has it entered into your... Listen, I'm a pastor. God's doing cool stuff in me. I'm a pastor, but you're a business leader. You're an entrepreneur. You're a school teacher. What does crazy outrageous look like to you? You own a restaurant. God can do something crazy in your restaurant. So we got to elevate our faith this year. Stop agreeing with the devil. Can I get an amen? The devil lies like a rug. Come on. It's going to be a good year. But uh, I'm going to get started today. If you're brand new to our church, I'm going to open up the Bible. We're going to Acts chapter 10. We've been in a series, um, been in it for a while now, and I still feel as much unction on this series as I did in the beginning, that we serve a God that gives master dreams. The master has a dream for your life. The reason why some of you are empty is because you made money, but you've never made a difference towards your master dream. God, God made you for a specific purpose. He gave you your desires, your interests, your gift set, your skill set, your history. And God will use all of it to actually accomplish much to bring as many people into eternity with us as we can. You see, part of God's dream for your life is to unlock the dreams around, around you with the people that are around you. And I, I really felt like this morning is going to be special because as we start a new year, it's a really significant story in Acts chapter 10 about two guys that had a dream while they were fasting, while they were hungry. And today, if you're taking notes, I want to talk to you uh, on a subject no one likes to talk about, fasting. You can tell by that response right there. And I want to be honest, as a pastor, I do not like fasting. My wife will tell you I'm not interested in fasting most of the time. 
I don't like, I feel like I see, I see food everywhere. When I'm fasting, I see, come on, I'll see steak in the clouds. I'll see tomatoes and the brake lights in the car in front of me. I start fantasizing about food. Are you with me today? I don't like fasting just like most women don't like to give birth, but they like having babies. And I think many, many don't understand that that's spiritual disciplines are kind of like being pregnant and giving birth. We don't get excited about the labor pains. We get excited to hold the baby. And there is something I'm going to teach you today in learning how to develop your spiritual muscles in fasting that will help you birth the things that God wants to birth this year. If you don't birth something with God, you might bury some of your destiny. I don't want to bury destiny because I don't birth things with God. And so I want you to get ready to write some notes down. And before I get started, I want to say I'm not sure if Jenny Donnelly is still here today, but they have an event coming up in uh, Angeles Temple. Rashawn and I are actually going to be at it speaking. It's coming up, I think it's uh, February 9th and the 10th. And it's going to be in Los Angeles. So if you want to come to that, make sure you sign up. Uh, but hey, if you have your Bible, Acts chapter 10, Acts 10. It's a very, very famous passage in the Bible. Before Acts chapter 10, the only um, person that really ever experienced salvation like this would have been the Ethiopian eunuch. He got baptized. Outside of him, no one that wasn't Jewish was all the way in. And back in those days, they called them, um, they called them God-fearers, which were basically non-Jewish people that said, look, I'm, I'm tired of the Roman deities. I know there's a God in Israel that's real. I want to serve him. And most of them would not get circumcised, rightfully so. Um, and that was kind of the mark of being all the way dedicated. But they would still be God-fearers. And so we're going to read a story about a Roman centurion. He was a military officer. He lived in Orange County. Come on. He lived in the Mediterranean seacoast city of Caesarea. Very nice place to live. A lot of surfing there. Beautiful place. And he was serving in a, in a mid-level officer type of role, overseeing over 100 troops and we're going to read a story about this is the door opening for everyone on the earth that wasn't Jewish to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You guys ready to go? Very historic. But uh, today I want to talk to you about both of these guys. Cornelius is a Roman officer. Peter is an apostle. And here's the thesis of today's message is that both of them saw history made when they learned how to pray hungry. I want to talk to you today about the power of praying hungry. Tap your neighbor and say, pray hungry. And yes, it's about fasting, but I promise we're going to have a good time. You ready? Acts chapter 10, let's begin reading verse 1 here. I'll read a little bit different verses, guys, than the last service, but just stay with me if you can. Acts 10 verse 1 says, there was a certain man of Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion who was called uh, the Italian regiment. He was a devout man. A what man? Devout. He was devout, one who feared God with all of his household. Watch what else about this devout man. He not only feared God, he gave alms generously to the people. And, and he prayed to God always. When did he pray? Always. Who would say this sounds like a pretty good person? Yeah. So you fear God, your family fears God, you got a good family, you give generously, and you pray always. Who says good guy? Yeah. Sounds like a lot of people I know in Orange County, right? Good people. So he's a good guy, but it goes, goes on and says in verse 3, now about the ninth hour of the day, 3 p.m., he saw clearly in a dream or a vision an angel of God coming to him saying, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid. Everyone seemed to be scared when they saw angels in the Bible. He says, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up to God as a memorial. It is interesting to note this. Uh, even business people listen to me. This is powerful. He says, not only was it your prayers, it was your giving that got God's attention. I think one of the reasons why God has entrusted much responsibility in our church is not just because of the way we pray. There's something in the way that we give. He said, send these men to Joppa to Simon, whose surname is Peter. He's lodging with a guy named Simon a Tanner. So it says that he sent a few of his servants responding in obedience to this, this vision he had of the angel. And when he gets to, they, they send them in 30 miles. It would take two days to get to where Peter was. And when they got there, it says Peter was on the roof of a house. He was praying. And it says in verse 10, he became very hungry. Someone say with me, very hungry. He wanted to eat. They made the food ready that he fell into a trance, kind of like some of you are falling into right now. 
<laughs> Stay with me. Stay away from the light. Yeah. Yeah. Fell into a trance. And it says this, that uh, he saw a blanket with animals coming down. And it said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And we know that Jews did not eat unclean animals. They didn't eat anything with hooves. They didn't eat pigs. They didn't eat bacon. Come on, it's a tough, tough life. They didn't eat ham. They didn't eat crab. They didn't eat shellfish. Leviticus 11 gives us kind of the, the template of what they didn't eat. But he saw in this vision three times a pig in a blanket. Come on. <laughs> and uh, he saw it three times. And after he saw it, he says, I can't do that. He said, not so, Lord. Say it with me, not so. Lord. This is an oxymoron statement. One scholar said, you can say not so, and you can say Lord, but it doesn't make sense to say it together. Because if he is Lord, you can't tell him what he can't do. Good preaching right there. Someone today, you got to stop saying not so and start saying Lord. So he obeys God. He actually says there's people coming. That God spoke to him. Someone's coming. Go with them. Doubt nothing. So he goes with these guys, travels two days, gets to Cornelius' house. And when he gets there, Cornelius falls down tries to worship him. He says, get up. I'm a guy. I put, I put jeans on one leg at a time like you do. Settle down. And it says, I shouldn't be here today. Jews do not go into Gentiles' homes. But God gave me a vision. I saw it three times. He told me that, th that what he says is unclean, it's not uncommon. I, I need to be here. And basically God gives him revelation and he preaches Jesus for about five sentences. Verse 44 is we're going to stop reading here. Verse 44 says, while he's talking to Cornelius, his kids, his neighbors, all of his friends are in the house. While he's telling him about Jesus Christ being the one that came back from the dead, it says, while he was still speaking, verse 44, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. Some said that was a short message for people to receive the Holy Spirit. Well, how come your, how come your messages aren't shorter, Mark? I would say because you, you don't listen as good as this crowd did. They were a good listening crowd. But it says that when the Holy Spirit was poured out, they were, those that were circumcised, the Jews there, were astonished. There were seven of them, because that's how many you needed in, the, in that world to actually testify in court. He brought six with them. And so there were seven there. They eyewitnessed the fact that they all began to speak in tongues. They all magnified God. And then Peter said in verse 47, Can anyone forbid water that these also should be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit just as we have? And that was the door opening to everyone that wasn't Jewish. So we read here, when he tells the story in verse 11, it says that he was praying and fasting when Cornelius had an encounter with an angel. And I read it to you in chapter 10 that Peter was hungry when he saw the pig in the blanket. And so we know this, that God changed the world through two men that were praying hungry. You guys ready to go? I'm going to teach on fasting a little bit practically today, but I want to get the big idea into your soul, into your spirit today. There's something that unlocks inside of us when we get hungry to pray. You guys ready? Lord, we invite you this morning to meet us where we are. I know there's atheists here. I know there's agnostics here, Buddhists here, Muslims here. There's people that have gone to church their entire life. And there's people that this is the very first moment they've ever been in an atmosphere like this. So Lord, today I ask you to do what you do best. And that's meet every single one of them right where they are. I thank you that you meet us as we are, but you don't leave us as we are. So, Lord, lead us to Jesus. Show us your power. I pray that we leave knowing that we're close with you, right with you, walking and talking with you. In Jesus' name, and everyone that's gone hungry to pray, said a good old-fashioned amen. amen. I, uh, I, I have an amazing uh, family, and growing up, my grandma and grandpa, I was always fascinated as a little kid with their little Tupperware container. I thought it was the coolest thing. My grandparents, did your grandparents have this? They had a Tupperware com container that had uh, letters on it, and they put all their, pil their pills in there. Who's ever seen the pill Tupperware container? It's always fascinating with the pill Tupperware container. And, uh, you know, I just turned 40, as many of you know, last month, and I, I feel like my wife has me on a starter kit. She's been pumping vitamins, you know, like, I don't know what most of the stuff is. I joked last service, I could be high right now. <laughs> it's a joke. It's just vitamin C and stuff, I think. But, but she'll give me pills every morning. She'll say, Mark, take this, take this. 
Some of these pills are so big, I, I can swallow pills, but it's like activating my gag reflex. It's just terrible, man. I'm like, this is how it happens. It starts with one little vitamin, a multivitamin, they get you. That multivitamin's a gateway drug. Taking all these pills, I gotta drink a bottle of water to get all these pills down. And so I, uh, over Christmas break, I remember uh, Rochelle gave me one of these pills and, and it just, I mean, it was right before Christmas break and she's like, I was like, babe, my stomach's kind of queasy. And she goes, you didn't take that on an empty stomach, did you? How many of you ever done something on an empty stomach? I don't know if you know this, but there are some things you can't take on an empty stomach. I took zinc on an empty stomach. I was like, I'm not feeling right. She's like, you're supposed to, you didn't eat anything? I'm like, no, you didn't tell me. She's like, you've been taking this for like a year. I'm like, Rochelle, I rely on you to live. I don't have time to run the church and take care of everything and figure out what pills not kill me. You got to step in. You can't take some stuff on empty stomach, man. It's crazy. I was reading a study that even caffeine affects you differently on an some stuff in life is just, honestly, quite frankly, you got to be careful what you're around and what you do on an empty stomach. I would say it's dangerous to get done with the gym, go to the grocery store on a... The flesh will thank you for it. But that discipline, spirit of, spirit of God inside of you, is going to be like, dude, you just you blew it this week. My daughters always know when I go grocery shopping hungry. I'm just coming back with all this baked goods, carved out, right? It's crazy. I, I'm like, man, I'm gaining all this weight. I'm like, man, I must be wearing the armor of God. This stuff's heavy. <laughs> Getting on the scale. I, I literally, I'm like, I, I went grocery shopping, and the, the clerk at Trader Joe's is like, man, you, you must, kind of gave this, like, you must have a pretty big family. <laughs> so I got two girls. Shopping for a man's football team. <laughs> Shaming me, right? It's dangerous to go to a grocery store on an empty stomach. I, I, I've heard. I, I don't drink anymore. I drank before Jesus. I, I gave it up when I, when I got saved 22 years ago. So I've been sober for 22 years. Look, I won't judge you if you don't judge me. Is that all right? I hate when I go to like a restaurant and they're like, uh, what kind of wine do you want? I'm like, I don't drink. And they're like, oh, they're like mad. There goes my tip. I'm like, no. So what I do now is I'm like, no, I'm, I'm celebrating 20, 20, 22 years of sobriety. And they say, oh, congratulations. <laughs> so funny to me. Same setting. One's mad, one's happy. Someone got some notes today. I, uh, I, I literally, though, you can't, I heard it that you, you want to be careful with alcohol drinking on an empty stomach. You're more sensitive with an empty stomach. I would say that there's some things you should not talk to your spouse about on a, you get into a, you get a full on argument, just blow for blow, just yelling. You don't know why you're yelling. I think we started a conversation hungry. I think that's why we're here right now. Character assassination attempts. Like, why are we so upset right now? Oh, we haven't eaten in two days. I've learned, listen to me very closely, I've learned to be, to be aware of what you go after when you're empty. I would actually go on the record to say that humanity is in the predicament that it's in because of Adam and Eve, what they went after on an empty stomach. Genesis 25, Esau screws his destiny out of the will of God for a bowl of lentil stew. Because he came back from hunting on an empty, he would rather have, st he was so hungry. Like chicken tortilla soup, I kind of get it. Lentil? He sells his birthright for lentil stew. I actually believe that one of the hardest things in your life to do is to guard your appetite. To be aware of what am I craving? Because ultimately, what you crave the most is what you worship the most. I love this story. 
It's about an average good guy. I would say this guy sounds like Orange County to me. This guy feared God. And what I've learned about Orange County is even though a lot of people don't live for Jesus, there's kind of a baseline respect for him. So even people here that don't live for God, they still want their kids to go to, like, Christian school. Do that. Like, I'm, we don't live it, but just go do that anyways. <laughs> there's kind of a general fear of God in Orange County. There's definitely philanthropy in Orange County. A lot of events that we raise money. People love getting a good ROI on their philanthropy. But I've learned that there's not a lot of E-R-O-I, eternal return on investments. A lot of people invest in things that are temporary, but not eternal. That's what makes the church different than other philanthropy. It's an eternal investment. But this guy, Cornelius, he's living in a beautiful city. It's Mediterranean. He's an overseer. He's an influencer. If he's on social media, he'd have at least 100 followers. Get that one later. Sentry. So, sent, okay, well, thank you. He, uh, he has influence. He's got money. He obviously has money if he's giving money to people. And he actually prays always. Hey, media team, just a second. Could you put up Acts chapter 11, verse 14? I want to show something to you. Whenever you have it, just throw it up. But it's interesting because he prayed always, he gave generously, and he feared God. Can you say it with me one more time? What did he do? He, uh, he gave, he feared, and he prayed. What's interesting about this story is, uh, it says in verse 14, I'll just read it for you. It says that Cornelius summons Peter because he said, whoever comes, when these guys, when Peter comes, he will tell you words by which you, Cornelius, and your household will be So here's the revelation of that moment. This guy gave, this guy prayed always, and he feared God, but he wasn't saved. You're saying that I could, I could be spiritual and pray? I'm a good person, though, preacher. I, 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 I give money away, and I could be going to hell? That's what that says. And we know this, that uh, something inside of him knew that there was more. We know that there's something that knew there was more because he was willing to fast. He describes in Acts chapter 10, he says, hey, when I had the vision, I was in the middle, four days ago, I was in the middle of an empty stomach fasting. And when the angel showed up, you know what he said? He said, I heard your prayers. I heard your prayers. I'm trying to help you guys out. I heard your prayers. And I actually remembered your gifts. Here's what we know. If God heard his prayers and sent an angel and sent them to Peter, what was he praying? What was he praying? He's a good person. He prays. He goes to church. He gives generously. What would you pray if you're a good person already? Maybe he was praying that he'd have a relationship with God that was closer. Maybe he said, God, I've known you. I, I know you from the nosebleed seats, but I want to know you close. I've heard about you with my ears, but I want to see you with my own eyes. You see, I don't think that God was tolerating where he was. I think God was inviting him to come where he was. He got so hungry. I did a message last year called So Hungry, uh, Too Hungry Not to Fast. That he actually got this desperation in his heart that I'm going to give up food for a while. For those of you who don't know what fasting is, fasting is giving up something that you love for something you love even more. Fasting without pursuing God is dieting. In the church today, we have a lot of dieters, not fasters. We know it because they're excited to tell everybody on social media. Sorry, everybody. I'm going to be fasting for the next couple of days. Looking to really pursue the Lord and get deep with him. Please don't bother me. Please, can we stop announcing that we're leaving social media? Taking a social media cleanse to seek the Lord. I'll be back later if anybody's wondering where I traveled to. We don't care. Go seek God. Stop, po stop posting pictures of your food, too, please. We we're hungry around here, okay? I got to get on social media when I'm fasting because all of you are still posting food pictures. And I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fall into temptation here. It's crazy, though, that fasting is giving up something you love. And what I learned is, you know, diet will change your body, but fasting will change your perspective. 
When we fast, it's actually allowing God to shift our perspective. Fasting is powerful, people. We know that there's all types of fasters in the Bible, all types of fasting in the Bible. We know that Daniel and his buddies, they solved the nightmares of their time period by fasting. It was during a fast that God gave them the solution to the world's problems. It was actually during a fast uh, on the day of Pentecost. You know when it says Joel? Joel said, after this, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Do you know what Joel was doing before this? Fasting. Isaiah 58 talks about a fast that God chooses. Matthew 6 says, and when you give, when you pray, and when you... He doesn't say if you give, if you pray, or if you fast. He says... The problem with most Christians today, we have fans but not real followers. Fans want the rewards of Christianity without any of the responsibilities. We want to go to heaven. We just don't want to live like it here. I want to live as close to earth, as much like Babylon as I can, and still go to heaven. It's because you never developed your spiritual muscles. Some of you have never tried fasting before. I'm not condemning you today. I'm not throwing rocks at you. But I am challenging you. Because at Ocean's Church, if you're praying today, if you're brand new, is this going to be my new church? Well, here's a good question for you to answer. If you want to go somewhere that every week we're going to treat you like a follower of Jesus and not just a little Taylor Swift fangirl of Jesus. We got a lot of people that are, that are settling for a Sunday message. And that's the only following of Jesus they do all week. I'm not preaching to you today. I want to see an army of people that follow God seven days a week. Bringing Jesus into the boardroom, the classroom, the locker room, the bedroom. We're, we're raising up disciples at Ocean's Church. The great Rick Warren says the church's power is not in how many it sits, it's in how many it sends. We're going to send some people to go make a difference. Some of you have never developed your spiritual muscles because you've never done anything spiritual. Fasting is one of the great spiritual disciplines of life. There's something about that just, it has a way, when your stomach is empty, it has a way of giving God your heart. And I've learned this, that it's actually dangerous to dream with God when you have a hungry, empty stomach. Because when you start dreaming with God on an empty stomach fasting, God will start showing you things that you'll never do on your own. He'll start giving you potential that you could never access without God's divine help. I've learned that there's danger to darkness when we pursue God on an empty stomach. You see, fasting will enlarge your faith. It'll purify your heart. Jesus will give you revelations of your authority. And this is so powerful because fasting captures more of God's voice to your ears. It captures more of his presence in your spirit, more of God's strength to your body, and more of God's awareness in your desires. Some of you never fasted before, because the truth is, God isn't after your stomach. He wants your heart. And the way that God often gets our heart is when we give him our stomach. I've learned that what we, what we hunger for the most in life is actually what we truly worship. You know, what I want, you know what, more than anything this year, I want to get rich. Then that's what you mostly worship. I want to get married. That's what you mostly. I want to have babies. You can make an idol out of anything that's good. An idol is when you say, I will not be happy until I have. That's sitting on the throne of your desires. And what you desire the most is what you, or hear me today, you worship the most. And I want you to know we draw strength from God to give to others as we fast and we pray. Dreams and visions come after fasting usually. It was like Daniel that he he gave the answers to society's nightmares in this moment. Because fasting is an intensifier. It actually, it shows you that there is more. You see that the story of Cornelius is he had a good life. He was a good person doing good things that was missing out on more. And there's something that went off inside him that goes, you know what I'm willing to do? I'm going to put aside food for a while and I'm going to pursue God. And it says God heard his prayer and he saw his generosity. I've, I've actually found this to be true. People that fast are usually tithers and prayer people. People that have never fasted are usually the same people that never tithed, and they hardly ever pray. There is something about praying and fasting and giving that are all connected. That's why Jesus says the three trifolds of Christianity. When you give, don't be like the hypocrites that brag. When you pray, don't stand in front of everybody and say, look, look how great I am at praying. And when you fast, don't go on social media. Sorry, everybody. Doing this big 21-day 
juice fast. Hashtag cleanse. Hashtag take care of myself. Me time. My day. Narcissism. Jesus. You know what hunger pains do when you're fasting? They remind you of what you're fasting for. You're giving up something that you really like for something you like even more. And I'll be honest, I don't like fasting. I, I'll be very, I, I, have to, I, have to, I have to study myself and pray myself into this frame of mind. But every, every January for the last 22 years, I fasted. And every, every year in January for the last 22 years, what I prayed about in January usually materialized somewhere in those nine months, 10 months, 11 months. 12 months. It's interesting that the guy I'm going to his house and the, and the pastor that's taken me under his wing was the guy that last January, I said, there's two pastors in America I want to learn from for Oceans Church. It's this guy and the other guy. Yeah. I wrote two business guys down that are in the business world of the body of Christ that I want to have come speak at our business conference when we launch it. Yeah. And out of those two business guys, one of them was John Maxwell. And the other one, is, uh, I won't say his name, big, big in that world, and I put both of those names down in January. I got invited to John's house in February, and the other guy on the list, I talked to for an hour on the phone yesterday. That's coincidental, Mark. It's not coincidental. This guy lives in Alabama. Like, how do you? I don't know anybody in Alabama. A couple people, maybe. <laughs> I see you. But the truth is, is I believe that when you aim at nothing, you hit it every time. I'll tell you right now, what, what, what would you be desperate enough to fast for? How about your marriage? What would you prioritize going after God with all your heart? How about your babies? You know, I've been fasting for 22 years for the guys that my daughters marry one day. I know they're not going to marry jokers. I've been fasting and praying before they came to the earth about what type of men they're going to marry. What have you been fasting? I, I've been fasting for Ocean's Church years before I moved to California. I knew what type of church this would be because I saw it every year when I gave up food and I pursued God. What would you fast for, preacher? How about your finances? God, I'm not going to be in debt. I'm not going to stay in debt. God, God showed Rochelle and I how to get out of debt when we were probably four years into our marriage. Paid off our cars, had everything paid off except our house. God taught us at a young age. I was a janitor making $8 an hour. And God showed us how to get out of bad situations. I'll tell you that if you want God to come into an area, then give it to him in prayer. I pray for my, I don't just pray for goals, I pray for my health. And here's what I think so many people miss it. They, they're, they're too focused on setting goals. And I'm not against goals, but here's what I'm for. I'm for asking the questions, what's preventing health in this area? And if you can find out what's making your marriage unhealthy, you can have great a marriage. And if you can find out what's stopping your business from growing, you can have a great business. So I usually ask the Lord, rather than saying, God, would you grow us? I just say, Lord, would you show us how to get healthier? What's the most unhealthy thing in our church right now? What's preventing us from growing right now? Do you know why you're sitting in the tent set like this? Because we figured out one of our problems was we were running out of space. So we do one jumbo tent with some smaller tents. We get more chairs. Next thing we're going to do, we're going to buy a shuttle bus. And we're going to start parking all of our real Christians <laughs> further away. Why? Because all of our new people don't want to park far away. But I don't mind parking at Muralands, shuttle busing over in the morning, if that means that Billy that would never go to church can get a front spot. These are things that they're not hurting us, but they might be affecting our health. And I believe if you'll do this for your business and go, Mark, well, th th I was talking to God, and God told me this is what's preventing me right now from doing better in my business. How can I make this healthier? And rather than setting these big goals, I'm going to run. Okay, I'm going to walk with the Lord the rest of my life. Today I felt like the Lord wanted me to tell you that fasting will do a couple things. I want you to write them down today. Fasting will change us, not God. Some religious people think, well, you're fasting so God loves you more. No, God can't love you anymore. I don't fast so that God can love me more. 
I fast so I can love God more. Can I get an amen? And listen to me, there's three types of fast. I'll break into this real quick. Is there is an absolute fast, which I absolutely don't recommend. <laughs> it's when you do water and food, and you better make sure you're consulting with the doctor if you're doing this. There is a couple of these in the Bible. When Esther called everybody to pray before she went before the king, she said, don't eat anything, don't drink anything. We're going all in. But you can die if you mess up that fast wrong. So you want to absolutely get some help. Amen? But there's a, there's a normal fast, which would be when you put aside food, like solids, and you drink water. I recommend you getting clean water, like bottled water or something. And also, if you get weak, you can drink chicken, chicken broth. Uh, chicken, chicken. <laughs> Trick or treat broth? <clears throat> no. Uh, chicken broth. You, you go to Chick-fil-A. In Idaho, or our church started fasting in Idaho, the Chick-fil-A would actually strain, strain the chicken noodle soup. So you can just drink the broth from, from that place. And so we can do that. But I'm telling you, there's something powerful. You can do juices. But here's the deal. I want to remind you this. Fasting is not stop eating, but you're still watching the same shows listen to the same bad music, having the same, same bad habits. That's called extreme dieting. Fasting is when you normally would be reading or watching movies, binge watching Netflix, scrolling social media, the word of God is open. My wife and I have been doing the 30 day shred. We're going through the Bible in 30 days. 50, 35 to 42 chapters every day. But all I'm doing is when I normally would be on social media or watching TV or, or just wasting my time shopping, whatever it is, I'm in the Word of God. And I'm telling you, you want the rest of the 11 months to be awesome? Give God January. We're doing something this year we've never done before. I've never been overly ambitious. So I'm like, we'll do a three-day fast. We'll do a seven-day fast. But this is a big year for America. It's a big year for California. And it's a big year for Ocean's Church. We're doing Baptized California this year. So I'm enlisting all of the real Christians in our church. It doesn't have to be water and juice. You can do a Daniel fast, which is a partial fast would be when you actually, Daniel didn't do no meats, no sweets, uh, and, and no wine. And he just, he just ate pretty much vegetables. No, no pleasant food, which sounds easy. But you go to Mastro's and your friends are ordering steaks. And lobster and crab in that, that seafood tower that has the smoke. And you're eating a plain baked potato. You'll know that's for the Lord. What I, what I usually do is I'll start with like a, a, a regular normal fast, just water. And when I get weak, day two or day three or whatever it is, I'll start doing broth. Then I'll do juice. And when I, when I feel like I broke through, I usually do a duration connected to the urgency of what I'm praying for. Before I married Rochelle, I fasted three days. I did one day for God to heal my past. One day for God to give me vision for my future. And the last day I said, Lord, is Rochelle the one I'm supposed to marry? You know, and there's that verse in the Bible that says it's better to marry than to burn. Rochelle was going to burn if she didn't marry me. So, uh, just kidding. Just throw that in there. But the Lord spoke to me that fast, those three days. If you're going to relocate your family, you're going to switch churches. You're doing something that's life-changing. I'm telling you, we're going to stop being so flippant with big choices. There's power in fasting. Here's what I know about fasting is fasting doesn't change God. It changes us. Number two, you know what it'll do? It'll, it'll help strengthen. God will strengthen and guide you in your fast. Some of you, I dare you to get a, get a journal out and say, God, I'm going to read my Bible for an hour or two today, and I'm going to have my journal out. I'm asking for ideas for my business, ideas for my marriage. I have goals for my marriage, my children, as a dad, as a father. I have, I have goals as a husband and then as a pastor. There's things in my heart to write books. and There's things I'm supposed to do. I write them down in January. So I want to challenge you, church. Every January, we're, we're putting God first. Next 21 days, between now and January 28th, I'm asking everyone to fast something. Maybe you can't do water. Maybe you can't do food, but you can fast social media. You can fast television. You can fast uh, things that you're addicted to that aren't healthy for you. Let's give God something that matters to us. If you said, Mark, fast reading comic books, it'd be easy. I don't read comic books. 
So if you fast something that doesn't matter to you, it doesn't matter to God. We're going to give God something that costs us something. And here's what I know is that it'll increase your spiritual capacity. Some of you are going to start hearing the voice of God as you fast. Some of you are going to get your, sensi- your spiritual senses sensitized as you fast. It'll increase your spiritual capacity. And this is the last thing I, want, I believe that's going to happen as we pray and we fast. There is something about breaking bondages, breaking addictions, breaking barriers when we fast. We know the archangel came to Daniel. He said, look, it took 21 days. God sent me three weeks ago. But it took us 21 days of you praying and you fasting before we took over the prince of Persia. And I think there's things that won't happen. Jesus said, some things only happen when we pray and when we fast. Are you saying that God will love us more? No, I'm saying there's some things God will not do. Here's what I've learned. Most of our needs are met because of God's goodness, but most of God's promises are attained through persistence, diligence, pressing, I lay hold, I press on, I forget what's behind. Paul said, I run with purpose in every single stride. There are some things we only get to when we're going hard after God. And I believe this, if we'll do this, we'll see bondages break this year. Ultimately, Cornelius didn't want to stay the same. He knew there was more. But he prayed always, he was spiritual, he gave, he was fearing God, but why would he fast? I'll tell you why he fasted. Because he believed that if he would go after God with all of his heart, that God would welcome him. Some of you this year, we're going to put aside a few days, a few weeks, to pursue God. And I believe as you shut the door behind you, you open up your Bibles, and you say, Holy Spirit, I welcome you. You watch how God begins to welcome you into friendship with him. The Bible says the secrets of the Lord are with the people that fear him. You honor God, and God honors you. Can I get a good amen? Second thing is I I believe that Cornelius said, God, I want to be welcomed into friendship, and I want to be forgiven. Some of you are carrying trauma from two decades ago that God wants to unhitch from your life. I felt like that that even right now in this atmosphere, I can feel like some of you, it's like you're really powerful, and God gave you a great engine to go fast, but you're pulling trailers full of junk with no wheels on it. And it's just like sparks behind you everywhere you go. And I believe that as we fast, we seek God. Isaiah 58 says, it'll break the bondages. So we're going to seek God forgive. Thirdly, we're going to seek God heal. You have a family member that needs healing? You need healing? We're going to fast and pray. I remember we went to Saturate OC a couple years ago. My youngest daughter, she had these blisters on her hand. We don't know what they were. Anytime her hands got wet, there'd be these white blisters, really big, on the ends of all of her fingertips. It got worse and worse. We were actually getting ready to take her into the doctor, and we prayed in January that God, that year, would heal our daughter. It would have been a few weeks later, we went to that baptism in Huntington Beach, and it was in the waters of baptism. She was at the time, I think, four or five years old. She looks up at at Rochelle and I, and she goes, Daddy, Mommy, I want to get baptized. I'm like, you're too young to get baptized. (laughs) I was like, okay, if you want to get baptized... And I put her in the water. I took her in. Rashad, I baptized her. We came home the next day. She was in the bathtub, and normally her hands would get so bad. And I looked down, and she had no blisters. None. I took pictures the day before. All the, so we were to take her to the doctor. And the next day, we, we, we uh, looked in the bathtub, and I said, Chloe, where's your blisters? She's four years old. She goes, oh, Jesus healed me. I'm not, I'm not in line. We're shot. I go, what are you, what? She's four years old. She said, yeah. Matter of fact, she goes, yeah, Jesus healed me when I got baptized. Those blisters never came back. I believe in a God that heals. Are you fasting so that God will answer? You can manipulate God? No. I think there's some things that God says, I'll invite you into another, another realm, but I'm only going to honor your appetite. Some of you are so full of yourself, you're not hungry for God. And this is going to be a fast that we get rid of our selfish hunger. And we say, God, I hunger and I thirst for you. Lastly, I believe that as you fast, there is transformation that takes place. You want to renew your mind? Two most important messages to humankind. Number one, you can be saved. You can know Jesus personally. 
But after he gives you, gets a hold of your heart, second most important message, God can change you. You don't have to die like you were born. You don't have to die in the bondages that your parents died in. God can cut the Goliath's head off of your family line. And God can do a new thing in you that no one's ever done before. Start a righteous lineage in your family. God will transform your life. The Bible wasn't written to answer all of your questions, but it was written so that you could become like Jesus Christ. We know what he was like. We know what he values. We know what he's interested in. We know what honors him. We know what God goes after. And we can go after that and that transformation. So today we're going to pray. And I want to ask you a question today. Will you let God make you hungry to pray? Will we give God our empty stomachs? And again, maybe it's not food. Maybe you're going to empty out something else that matters to you. But for the next 21 days, I'm asking everybody to fast something. Because 2024, I believe in Jesus' name, is going to be a year of breakthrough. If you believe it, shout a good amen. You stand on your feet. He's here. He's here. Can I ask you a question today? How many would say, Mark, I want to get, I want to actually, uh, I want to pray empty. I want to start praying. I want to learn how to pray on an empty stomach. I want to have a passion to pray. If you're here today, say, Mark, I believe God's leading me into fasting something in January. I want you to lift your hands towards heaven right now. God determines the fast. But we're going to do our part. We do what we can, and then God does what he can. We have our hands up this morning. Just say this prayer. Say, Jesus, we ask you, lead us into the fast you're calling us to do. I'm asking in Jesus' name. You would change us. You would strengthen us. You would guide us. Increase our spiritual capacity. Break bondages. Welcome us into friendship. Forgive us. Heal us. Transform us. In Jesus Christ's name. God, I just thank you as Cornelius prayed on an empty stomach, as Peter prayed on an empty stomach, God, you did something powerful. So I'm asking today that we learn how to pray, pray hungry. We learn how to pray with a hunger for you. I'm asking in our marriages and our families and our children and our grandkids, our grandparents, even as we sing this song in just a moment, we're believing that this is going to be a year of household salvations. Notice that Cornelius didn't just get saved. His entire household, everyone in his house, the Spirit of God came over. If you have family members this year, you're believing to get saved, raise your hands. Come on, raise your hands. I want you right now with your hands up just to say, God, I'm believing. Everyone, my last name, my family, my bloodline, we're going to serve the Lord. We call them in. North, east, south, west, poor, rich, all tribes, all tongues, all nations, coming home to the Father's house in Jesus' name. We're going to sing this song one time. Don't leave. Let's pray real quick. Come on, let's, let's worship real quick. See you. See Sing it never gets old.
church as for me and my house we're going to serve God this year we're not going to give God our leftovers we're going to give him our first and we're going to give God our best I think that we're going to learn how to pray on an empty stomach we're going to be sensitive to God's voice with an empty stomach that we're going to get so hungry of God and hungry to God that we get emptied of ourselves Holy Spirit I pray that you would remove the bad appetites I pray that you would wash us out physically and spiritually. I just pray that you would get out the old, the old doubt, the old trauma, the old pain, and that God, you would do a new thing. Would it not spring forth? We're believing in Jesus' name, something brand new is getting ready to erupt. We feel it in our state, we feel it in our region, and we believe it's gonna happen in our families. So right now with your neighbor's hand, we just pray right now over our neighbor, we say in Jesus' name, on Ocean's Church say in Jesus name we release the blessing of God makes rich adds no sorrow give a hunger to pray pursue to trust and honor you more than ever before I pray for both neighbors to know you closer than ever before in 2024 in Jesus name you receive that prayer say amen let's give God a five or ten second hand clap he's a good God you feel him here today mighty God he's here let's do two quick things to get you out of here if you're here today we do this every week part of the reasons we got to make these massive tents and add more chairs is because every week God's healing people you saw in the video, every week people get saved. We had 25 people last service got, gave their life to Jesus. Just here, not saying one. The week before I left, I was gone last weekend, but the week before that, we had 90 people give their life to Jesus in one weekend. God is on the move. And I believe there's going to be a harvest of souls here. i got to ask two quick questions which out of here. If you need a physical touch in your body, if it's sickness, addiction, or just you need a touch from God, it doesn't make you strange. It just makes you honest. We believe God can touch you today. God can heal you today. If you have a physical need, sickness, some, some, something you want deliverance from, I'm going to take about 60 seconds to do this. Just pop your hand up real quick. It doesn't make you weird. It just makes you honest. I have a physical need. Well, I've raised my hand before, preacher. Well, I would raise it every time until God does it. Just like I would go back to the gym until you want the results you came for. Does that make sense? So hands up all over oceans. You know the drill. If someone's hands up next to you, just find, it, find someone, put your hand on their shoulder. Jesus told us as disciples that we would lay hands on the sick. We lay hands on those that are in need. That the prayer of faith would save the sick. And it says that God would raise them up. So I want you to pray this prayer after me as you lay your hands on these people, oceans. Say, Jesus, I pray in your name. In the name of Jesus Christ. I bind all spirit of infirmity 
in any spirit that's not the Holy Spirit. We evict darkness, diseases, disorders, and shame. And we release the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. Fill them up, head to toe. Heal them and give them a story to tell. Get all the honor and let many believe that you're still alive and you still do the impossible through their testimony. In Jesus Christ's name, and if you received that prayer, say a good amen. Come on, you can say a good amen. I really feel like today there's some of you that you've been trying to get pregnant for like a long time, five, 10, 15 years. And I just, I, I wanna release this word. I've done this a handful of times, maybe three or four times a year, but I really feel strong that there's someone in this service today that you came to God and you're gonna fast this year, go after God and you're gonna get pregnant in the next probably 30 days. And I really believe that by about this time next year, you'll be dedicating a baby in our new building. And that's, that's, that feels good to say that, in our new building. We're gonna dedicate this child. But if you need a miracle, I'm just gonna pray right now, but miracles are happening all over this church. It was cool, one of our security guards, his, he started coming to our church because we pay him to be our security guard. We got one, one guy out of it, right? But he brought his wife, and his wife never been to a church like ours. They couldn't get pregnant. And it was in this church service that I prayed like this, and she raised her hand, and one of our college girls prayed for her. She ended up getting pregnant a few weeks after that. It was a miracle. And I believe there's going to be miracles today. If you or someone you know is trying to get pregnant this year, would you just raise your hand? Just be honest, okay? Maybe it's not you. Maybe it's your brother, sister, or whatever. Just raise your hand if you know someone that's trying to get pregnant right now. I want you to raise your hand in proxy. Father, I pray. I just believe this is going to be a year of birthing and not burying. I pray against any miscarriages, any stillborn babies. I declare in Jesus' name it's going to be a year of healthy pregnancies. It's going to be a year of marriages and not funerals. And it's going to be a year of birthing babies and not burying people. Father, this is a year of blessing. It's a year of expansion. It's a year of growth. It's a year of stre strengthening and stretching out our tent pegs. So, Father, we bless these that have their hands raised now in Jesus' name. And if you receive that prayer, say amen. Can I pray one more time? One last prayer today. If you're here listening to me, maybe you're watching online, or maybe you're physically in the tents today, you're outside listening to me, I want to ask you an honest question. Do you want today to make a choice to give God your life and do it the first Sunday of the year instead of maybe dragging it out another year? I feel like some of you, you're either going to do it today or you're going to do it the last Sunday of this year. And as your pastor, if I become your pastor, maybe I am your pastor, I would recommend doing it sooner than later. Two reasons. We don't know what's going to happen this year. But secondly, I know this. All of my regrets are connected to what I did before I knew Jesus. Not after. And actually, everything that God has led me into, I've never regretted. But everything that I've done in my own strength is what I've regretted in my life. So I want to invite you. This is not manipulation. It's a very simple message. Jesus lives. 2,000 years ago, he died on the cross for your sins because you need a Savior. He got out of the grave. He's alive. You can live with him. You can know him. His Holy Spirit will move inside of you. He can speak to you. He'll give you an appetite to read the Bible. He'll give you wisdom. And he'll give your life a purpose on the earth. But it requires you surrendering. It requires you saying, God, you're God, I'm not. Some of you have a hard time praying that because you're so proud. But God resists proud people. But he gives grace to the humble. And I hear the Lord saying, if you'll be humble enough to raise your hand today, God will be powerful enough to change your life. But it starts with an outward expression. God, I want you. So I'm going to leave hands, I'm going to leave eyes open today. Because if you can't raise your hand and say, God, I want you in my life to be God in front of Christians, I have a news announcement for you. You will never live for Jesus outside of church. You won't. But if you can get proud of Jesus inside of a church, that's the first step of representing God outside of this thing. I already saw one hand go up. If you want to give your life back to God, 
or for the first time put your faith in Jesus Christ, real high, just raise your hand. I feel boldness here today. I'll give you three seconds to raise your hand. One, yeah, more hands going up. Two, today is the day I get right with God. I'm giving my life back to God. Real high, don't be shy. Three, real high, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. I see six hands, anybody else? Six, seven, anybody else? Eight, anybody else? Eight hands, eight hands, awesome. So good. Nine hands, I see in the very back, so awesome. See nine. Put your hands down. Let's pray with those nine. Say, Jesus, I believe you are alive. I believe you died and you rose from the grave. You paid for all my mistakes. So I say thank you. And today, I invite you to be the leader, Savior, Lord of my life. Forgive me, heal me, and lead me from this day forward. In Jesus' name, I ask three things. A great church, a love for the Bible and prayer, and friends in a small group that can show me your ways. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, would you say amen? It's a great way to start the year off. I love you guys. Come on, give God a hand. Grab a seat.